Hello and welcome to this week's episode of An Irishman Abroad with me, Jordan Regan, as always. Well, comedy's changed, there's no doubt about it. When I came over here to the UK in 2013, the whole point of being here was so that you could gig, so that you could find clubs where you could play regular comedy shows most nights of the week. And that seemed to be the only path into it. And in so many ways, there's huge problems with that. You had to go to the Edinburgh Fringe, take unpaid work and then employ a huge PR team for some reason, which meant that it favoured those that had money. And I certainly didn't have that. It was a strange, strange time in comedy as it moved between the old world, the 1996 Perrier-focused world, and this new oncoming technology that I guess Irish Man Abroad was part of. I mean, I'm regarded as an early adopter of this whole podcast thing. But really, I had no clue what was coming next and how, while 2,000 people might see my show at the Edinburgh Fringe each August, 2,000 people might see a funny video you make in the first minute it goes online. It's a welcome change. I, I really think that this move towards social media and comedians being able to make money from the comfort of their own homes, make a living for themselves and explore their creativity from Ireland without the need to go abroad is something I'm I'm delighted about. And that's one of the many reasons why I'm so happy to have Tony Cantwell on the show. Tony, if you don't already know him, is one of these new generation comics. He's one of Dublin and Ireland's most beloved comedians and improvisers. His online videos have generated millions and millions of views. And as a result, he hasn't had to build his audience by plodding around clubs and up and down the M1 and around the M25. He's built this cult following through hard work and graft and creating flipping hilarious alter egos like Plune and your ma's mate, uh, the Dublin Frenchman and hundreds, and hundreds more on his Instagram stories. Tony Horror. You should give him a follow now if you haven't already. But like so many Irish performers, he didn't think that entertainment was something that would happen for him, that that was something that he could get a job in. He thought it was off somewhere else. Then that all changes when his ma buys him an iPad for Christmas and he starts making short videos to entertain his friends. One thing leads to another and one of those clips goes viral. The rest is history. I don't know, is it history? (laughs) It's a really good story that Tony tells here. uh, You're going to love it, including his first failed attempts at comedy in that thing I mentioned, the grim London open mic circuit. Grim is the word. Uh, getting his let go from jobs and searching for the new thing, the right thing, the right thing for him. Eventually finding it accidentally and realizing exactly how much work goes into it. <laughs> the stress of that work. When you're an online comic like him, the gig never ends. It's just on all the time. The, the audience is always watching. Uh, it comes with a degree of stress but of course he does online his online stuff is now married to this stage performance he's been to the edinburgh fringe it's not like he hasn't done that side of things and finding how to make it work on stage is the thing that a lot of people don't do tony cantwell has done that and he'll be performing at the paddy power comedy festival with me same show uh the end of the month in Dublin, uh, same stage, the Paddy Power Comedy Festival kicks off the final weekend of July. ppcomedyfestival.com to book your tickets to see us. Or if you're a planner, you can go and see Tony in Vicker Street this September. That's the small talk. Now let's get down to business. Now, your programme. What's the big idea? 
well, they've grown to know the Irish much better. We've now got to know how largely their mind works. I moved over here and immediately I had to up my game. I could not have done the job I, I did for quite a number of years in Ireland. I had to go and earn my living in England. I think a lot of it's in my hair. I think there's a lot of Ireland in here. I had an Irish upbringing. 20 years after an Irishman couldn't get a fucking job, we had the presidency. It was some heightened awareness of how hard my tribe had had it in London. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Never has a nation so small inspired so much in another. So you could say there's always been a little green behind the red, white, and blue. Our family is very Irish, you know. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special announcement to make at this stage. Would you welcome, please, the wonderful Charlie Thrigo! Tony Campbell, thanks for doing the Irish Man Abroad. I wanted to ask to start things off, you know, which which do you feel was harder? Leaving your job and going full time creating content and being, uh, you know, a humor guy <laughs> yes, <laughs> at that point, <laughs> that's what you were. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, the transition from being, you know, Tony Cantwell in a relationship, happy out uh, to being suddenly responsible for the life of another human being. <laughs> I mean, so actually going full time was just a really, you know, pursuing being a humor man, as you say, Amy humor man um, <laughs> was was just one of those things that kind of happened to me. It, it probably would have been something that I, I certainly would have found very difficult to do now. But I worked in this job in this, you know, high paid sales job, which I've yet to <laughs> I've yet to earn the same in comedy <laughs> that I did then. But um is you know really great job uh, in sales, and I didn't know if I wanted to do sales you know forever. But I my, my wife got an amazing job in Ireland, and I was going to move back. We did move back, and um, so you're, you're in up. London. Who were you working for? Can you tell us? We were work. I was working for this company called Perkbox. Perkbox, uh, yeah. Perkbox. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. <laughs> it's just the most you know. I mean, it really blew up after I left. <laughs> um, How did so what was, did Perkbox do? Perkbox sold. Um, they kind of were kind of like selling, uh, per like still <laughs> perks. Um, they were kind of like you know the way like in American companies you have all those credit card benefits that you get, you know, mm -hmm. percentages off here, and you might yeah. get access to lounges and all this stuff. It was kind of putting together a similar credit card perks package for individual companies that they could give their employees. So, like I don't know, say if it's Coca Cola, your Coca Cola employee, you log on to your perk box Coca Cola account, and it's all branded in Coca Cola. But all these perks are like you get a free cinema ticket every month, or you get all this kind of stuff. So we would kind of sell that as kind of uh, an early adopter of the kind of wellness package, employee wellness, mental mm -hmm. health, all that trendy stuff. <laughs> we were there, we were early adopters of that. Well, so uh, I was like managing this big team and then i was going to leave and I, we did the whole leaving thing i was you know popular there i had they it was a it was a startup so they spent far too much money on my going away party they hired a marching band that all had <laughs> tony Cantwell masks and it was like a very nice end to working there and then as i was leaving that day one of the um, directors said hey look we're out looking to open an irish office so if you can just hang on and work remotely uh, you know, you can maybe take over the Irish thing if, if that happens. And then after about two months, they were like, yeah, we're not doing that. So we need to give you redundancy. Oh <laughs> so God. I tried to quit and then they had to give me redundancy and buy all of oh. my stocks back from me. So they essentially gave me um, like a good three or four months wage, you know, I mean, probably a year if I was being uh, frugal. Um so that was at the same time the videos were taken off. And I'm like, well, if I don't take this essential six months wage uh, and just do something with this, then I'm a fool. So that was like the easy decision. There was I mean, only one way dream. to go. It's the dream. It's kind it of whatever. Happen. When people are talking about their side hustle, they always talk about, you know, hold on to the job as long as you can. And if at all possible, accumulate a cushion to allow mm -hmm. you through that difficult first six months. You had it handed to you with a silk cushion a with silk your cushion. face embroidered onto it. <laughs> with a marching band. <laughs> with a marching and band so. presenting it. But yeah. I don't get the impression like that you hated the job, which is, you, you know, I can't, I couldn't stand my job when I worked in an office prior to becoming a, com a humor man. A humor man. I, uh, 
I was so sad, like a really, really, really sure. down. Sure. <laughs> but you sound like you were you were loving it. I have coasted <laughs> through my life. <laughs> I have always just, I'm always just lucky. Everything's just, I don't, uh, you know. I mean, I probably, I mean, I have had like a good, like there's a good like eight years of me hating my job and having depression, but it still like got by and I still was able to afford cans and I was still able to play PlayStation and hang out with my friends and, you know, have a very kind of fulfilling life. I've never, I've just always been able to just get, you know, like I shouldn't have what I have. I've been fired from like six different jobs, you know, <laughs> um, I shouldn't have a, a, you know, a career in comedy, um. You know, but I did enjoy it. And actually what I liked about it was it was probably something that, you know, uh, kids actually probably have find out when they're probably your son's age that like when you're in a team, you know, it's actually fun to be part of a team and it's fun to at the end of it have someone tell you, oh, you did a good job or, oh, yeah. you know, Compliments. great feedback from someone else. And it's it's quite a solitary life we have as as comedians. But Massively. I didn't. Yeah. play i didn't play any kind of team sports so like at 27 i'm now being like oh so this is what a relationship with a coach <laughs> feels like you know uh this feels nice this, I like this, this. is this the camaraderie they were talking about <laughs> <laughs> i know but i just kept thinking no if you're sport i'm I, like i was a goth i was a rocker i'm like that's conformist if you support man united if you play football you're all i don't know you're all sheep man wake up sheeple i'm gonna be different and dress in a black hoodie with everyone else <laughs> at temple bar music center you know um, yeah okay we're getting a good picture here because yeah. these again were questions i wanted to ask about <laughs> you know who who you were because it feels like when you arrived on the scene you're fully formed like you know you're, it's partially your voice as well <laughs> that your voice is such a you know mainstay it's like a it's like a familiar place i don't know what it is you must get this all the time <laughs> about your voice it's like this man has been broadcasting since birth <laughs> well i weirdly like well like i as early as i as i could like i remember getting like a talk boy remember from home alone oh yeah like the the, the toy actually made from <laughs> the movie home alone um and like we'd like you know the first thing you do with it of course is you know record uh, do you like farts and then you just tell someone <laughs> then you ask someone hey do you like ice cream and then you hit record just as they say yeah and then you have them on <laughs> tape saying they love farts um so after that kind of you know ran its course i was trying to do radio shows i was trying to do like you know um just hear me <laughs> just hear me just please everyone listen to me all the time you know so it was from an early age trying to do some form of a broadcast you know um i think when ricky gervais started doing his podcast immediately me and my friends were just like let's talk about let's us three white guys talk about the most niche thing that we're into and hopefully that'll blow up in the same way ricky gervais's podcast did amazing you know? um, like i like i do find it odd then that you know that that wasn't the route that you went and i often think that this is an irish uh, tradition among creatives mm. that you think it's for somebody else there's yeah. some part of you that goes oh but you know that's that's what they would do that's what a com that's what's some somebody else is on the telly you don't totally, think me completely and was I, that, I, you? I, that was totally me and like i wouldn't necessarily say that we had like, it wouldn't be like a very Catholic upbringing. I certainly went to like Catholic school, but I've always seen with Protestants, they never feel like that this is the other side. <laughs> Protestants are like, yeah, I'm going to be a fashion designer. <laughs> and then they just do it. And the family's <laughs> like, okay. And it's not like we love, you know, oh my God, Church of Ireland, we support you. So it's not like that. They're like, okay. You know, it just doesn't mm. come with the same sort of, I don't know, <laughs> you know, that uh, the, the Catholics seem to get. I remember it's my dad telling me, one. yeah, I, I said I wanted to be a comedian. And he wasn't like discouraging of it, but he just said, okay, so you know, that's a lot of work. And I was like, I forget it. <laughs> forget it. <You laughs> when did you so, say that you know, to him though? When, when was that? I said that in transition year, I think. I think I said it, uh, we wrote a school play and I wrote, I mean, this was just my, I wrote a play that was just total mumblecore nonsense, just full of references. It was Kevin Smith inspired. It was Quentin Tarantino waxing poetic about his pop culture knowledge. That was just <laughs> dialogue for these 15 year old boys, you know, talking yeah. about my love of like Simple Minds and the Breakfast Club soundtrack and all this kind of stuff based on the kind of 90s movies that I that I like, real Cameron Crowe type kind of uh, dialogue. 
And uh, I remember my dad saying, I actually think you can do this. I think you could be a writer. Because before then, I was like broadly saying, I want to get a job in media. You know, I don't know what media. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's almost like, you know, you don't want to even say, I, I, I want to be a creative. It's just like, I want to get a job in media. That's mm. this. That, that's yeah, not that was business. The, it's just media. Yeah, it's the ballpark where you think nobody's going to go. You could never do that. <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. It, you keep it, it as broad as you can. It's not offensive to people's <clears throat> sense of what they can achieve. So you turn around to your data yeah. after this play and say, "Yeah, I think says, I, I want to be a comedian." Do this. And I'm like, "Yeah, I think I want to be a comedian." And he was like, "Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could." Now it is a lot of hard work. Um, and then <laughs> as soon as he said that, it was like a ringing in my ears, like. Dee! Like I'm checked out, totally checked out. I'm not doing that now. <laughs> Are you serious though? Like, did did you in that moment think, oh, I thought it was going to be easy, or um, or was it yeah, the way he said it to you? He, he I mean, he's he's a, yeah. He, he did say it to me in a kind of like, look, you know, that's it's very hard, and just also to kind of protect me of my feelings. I think even now he, you know, whenever I tell him that I'm a bit uh, anxious about a show that didn't go well, or if I'm a bit nervous about a big show coming up, he kind of, you know, he's supportive, but he has this kind of like, I don't know why you put yourself through that. Like he just wants to protect me from that, yeah. you know. Mm. Um, so I think it was kind of an early version of that, and him trying to just to to kind of protect you know that that you can go up there and be so vulnerable like that not that you have an issue of being vulnerable that you can just you can make go up there and get hurt you know if people don't exactly gel with what you have to give a hundred percent i feel that now even with my own son and i'm sure you feel that with yours that like you Mm. get now this urge to protect at all costs like for example you know, kids being mean <laughs> is yeah. what your dad's talking about. And yeah. I'm in the same boat with Mikey at the moment where I'm like, I can't, I can't say to, I can't protect him from kids being mean. Mm. Like you kind of got to go, that's part of life because it's mm-hmm. everywhere you go. There'll be a prick everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. if I protect yeah. him from how you navigate pricks, then mm. he's missing out on a huge life skill but your dad was more along the lines of i remember an uncle of mine telling me you've chosen a very difficult path (laughs) (laughs) and then this monocle fall into his mind (laughs) (laughs) that's how he said it and up to that moment i hadn't thought about it as a difficult path because you go off to Mm. iadt and study business and arts management but so that conversation with your dad veers you off the track so significantly that you do think i'll work in the business but i won't be one of the creators but you know i also threw a lot of things out there i mean i remember thinking like i was always just looking for the piece that fit and i was always you know for that eight years that I said I was jumping through odd jobs and getting sacked, you know, I was like, I was always like, what, like, what, like, what is it? Maybe it's a, an editor. Maybe it's, uh, I remember saying one time to my ex-girlfriend, I think I want to be a phyllo pastry chef and I have no cooking experience <laughs> whatsoever. And she's like, what the fuck? What's wrong with you? Just pick something, you know? And I'm like, no, it's not that, you know? So, um, same person I, who's I, now your wife. No, this is, uh, no, this is an ex. Okay. Um, no, um, no, my wife kind of got in there. No, I suppose I was still in the call centers and stuff like that when I was still going, doing odds and ends and I'd been probably sacked from like three different jobs when I met my wife. So, you know, she's a keeper, <laughs> you know, that I was getting <laughs> yeah. sacked from, but I just, from a uh, call you know, center. Because there does need to be someone there who's laughing, right? Well, when yeah. you are, you know, acting the bollocks around the house, you know, doing voices and <laughs> being silly. Like uh, in so many ways you do need that kind of intimate audience to start with or you'd never do it who was that person that laughed at you at the start uh, that built your confidence that hey what i believe is funny others Mm. agree well i mean definitely my 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 older brother we've a very um i just did a podcast with him there like we we've a very very similar sense of humor he would still be the person that really if i really think i'm putting you know putting something pretty far out there i would look for his kind of nod um of approval but i don't know it just that that was always kind of like the currency was it it's kind of like that's what i mm-hmm. that's what i kind of loved about kind of growing up when we did it's just everyone was just trying to make everyone laugh yeah. you know and and everyone knew the manners around it which was kind of you get in you get out you know yeah. like a good good chat is like fencing 
you know you just get in get out on guard and then you know you meet like a yank or something and they don't and then they get in and they're holding the attention for a bit too long like, no that's not how we do chat here you gotta you get in get in get out you know yeah so the rhythm starts talking yeah, yeah like oh i remember i saw the craziest thing ever last week and i'm like what that is not how we chat <laughs> you need to get in get out you know <laughs> yeah but it is like like growing up here or have, watching my son grow up here and seeing you know how different that attitude to storytelling is sure like for example last tuesday night i went down to my local track session uh, mm-hmm. and afterwards we had tea it was every tuesday first tuesday of the month they have tea and cake afterwards mm-hmm. which is very nice and i said very to the nice. man who's serving the tea i said Jeez, if there was tea every week, uh, I'd run a lot faster around that track. Not a great joke. Not a, <laughs> not up there in the pantheon of great jokes I've ever written. But sure. literally, chit-chat, small talk. And he said, we only do the tea on the first Tuesday of every month. <laughs> <laughs> and I came home and told Tina that I said and to his him. his monocle fell in the tea. Yeah, I, I said to him. Uh, but yeah, I'm just saying that like if you if you did it every week, I'd be so much faster knowing that I'm getting tea after this and cake. Oh, my God. And he said, <laughs> oh, we can't afford to do it every every week. We can only do it the Tuesday. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm like, Tony, this is, you know from living here that this isn't rare. That no, this is God. the Irishman abroad experience for so many Irish people. Like, in Sharon Horgan's uh, motherland she walks mm. up to a group of moms with prams and says what's happening with you crazy bitches and they look at her as if to go did you just call us bitches yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you are just going i don't know if i can live here sometimes yeah. when you make the choice to go to england uh you are leaving what you are describing as that's how we chat that's that's mm. not how we do chat you, you're you're coming here to where what i've just described is but in everything I read, you say that you you loved being in London and that it was like a bit of a step up from kind of what Dublin was at that time. Well, deficit, I mean, it, I left probably like a year and a half before before the financial collapse. So everything was still kind of booming, um, you know, when I left. But um, so I it, but it was more so that I just didn't really know. I just didn't know Dublin. I didn't really know Ireland. I mean, my entire map of Ireland for me was the difference the distance from my gaff in Rohini to like the HMV on Grafton street. And just that straight line, like that's the only thing I knew, you know, everything else on my map of Ireland was really? just, you know, you know, those old maps you see of like, you know, sea monsters and the edge of the world. Like that was, <laughs> that was beyond the M50 for me. Like I knew nothing. So I didn't really know what Ireland had to give. Um, and I knew that if I went to London, that I wouldn't have to really tell people what i was doing but i could tell them where i'm doing it and that's london <laughs> you know i'm sure now working in a shoe shop in london maybe you heard of it you know yeah, that's the uh, achievement the destination that's the achievement you know and then i still get to come home you know three or four times a year to a hero's welcome mm. and i'm like you know i was <laughs> you know i was i was buying three quid bottles of wine <laughs> last night ma'am like i'm uh, this is not you know I don't need deserve to be up on anyone's shoulders here. You know, I called in sick like for the fourth time. And if I do it again, I'm going to be fired. Like, but it's, it's this distance away. You're at summer camp, you know, Mm. and um, you kind of just, you just, yeah, you just can be a different, a different you, you know? Yeah. Um, There's a freedom. There's definitely a freedom to it. And, and I think that that initial glow Mm. then gradually fades, does it not? It does. I remember that I worked with this lady and I don't think she, she never really said anything insightful. Like she was, she would always, she wasn't the sharpest tool in the box, but I remember one time she said this thing that blew me away. She was all like, you know, London's like a, a Ferris wheel and you, but you just keep going around, getting to the top view and it's beautiful. And then you get down to the bottom. You're like, how long have I been on this thing? You know, it's just like it was to that effect. Like you just keep going and then you get up to the top and it's a London summer in London fields. And then you go back mm. down again and you're paying for your rent and rat carcasses. <laughs> and you had to kind of <laughs> to do anything. And then you go back up and you're like, oh, wow, you know, uh, field day and Hyde Park and uh, Pims and Wimbledon. And then you just go around, you know, so it took it was, ten, it was about 10 years. And I didn't realize, like, oh, I've been on this for 10 years and with not much 
not really much to show for it for me anyway mm, you know yeah um, it's it is it's uniquely rinsing in that way <laughs> to mm. your spirit and to your finances <laughs> very hard to get ahead it's a country that's very hard to accumulate stuff in and it doesn't sound like you were in the worst job but you had obviously some sort of thought in your head of i'll be a comedian one day because mm. you're still doing stand up on the side uh, yeah. I do find every account that you give of your days of doing stand up in London like truly extraordinarily funny and I, I just think that you should just be telling these stories. <laughs> <laughs> what about how I didn't know how to differentiate myself so I would say hey I'm from Ireland and if you don't know what that means I'm in the IRA and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it was my opening joke for too long. Um you know just that was the opening line. That that was it like it was just like hey I cuz you know you see it you see it Charlie you see like people they're like, they say something amazing. They say something like, look, I know what you're thinking. I didn't know that um, Jeff Goldblum had Hindi parents or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Like, and it's oh, dead I get on. It. Yeah. Because you look exactly like that, you yeah. know? And uh, you're, it's also one of those little titillating, oh, I didn't know I could think that thought that you just said out loud. And so, then, so then me going up and being like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, stupid jokes like, hey, I, I know what you're thinking. I don't, you know, I don't. it wasn't something like this, but it, it was something like, you know, uh, when did Stephen Fry become a black man? <laughs> you know, like I'm 23, <laughs> trying to make that kind of like edge lord joke, but it doesn't make any sense, and it makes sense to no one, you know. But uh, trying to mimic poorly what I saw other comedians successfully do, who, you know. Who were you, who were you trying to be when you went up first? Everyone has an act that they're ultimately. I mean, I trying suppose to impersonate nearly. I, I I suppose I was trying to be. I mean, I think I was trying to be Louis C.K. a little bit because I was trying to, in the same way that when he started calling his kids like assholes, you know, back when back when we could laugh at Louis and he called his kids like assholes. And that was so like, oh, I didn't know you could say that because I wouldn't expect him to say that. And it's not the mm. craziest thing in the world. And it's certainly not the, you know, um, by today's standards, not the most controversial. But I kind of thought, oh, that's kind of like he's being cruel to the people that he loves because he, he does love them. And we obviously know that about him. So I was trying to get that kind of style. But I think it just came across as like just abrasive and crass and, and you, you know. And you weren't like I have a quote here in front of me that it was only after four years of stand up that I realized I had to say some of this stuff out loud to myself before going on stage. <laughs> yeah. So are you telling yeah. me that you were going up having never said any of the things? No, like I had the words written on my hand, which was like, you know, a bidet, poop, butts, you know, and then I'm like trying to find that thought again that I maybe mm. said, not even in passing, but like I kind of, you know, or I would kind of just, I would write it down, but never actually get the actual cadence of it or understand what the inflection was. Mm -hmm. And I never understood. It took me four years to realize, no, you put the funny word at the end. You just put the funny word at the end and you're probably <laughs> fine, you know. But it is, you know? uh, like it is such a, the world of comedy has changed, it's safe to say, and everyone knows that. But mm. so much of my understanding coming into it at that time uh, the same kind of level as you into a London where London didn't want you on the comedy scene. It's like, no. country's full, kid. <laughs> yeah. Enough comedians. Yeah. Uh, it was about, the craft was repetition and carving mm. and editing. Uh, whereas what you do right now, so much of what I understand, the beauty of what you do is how out of your own way you are, how much in the moment that you're like this is what i this is my funny for today it's the best i got for you right yeah. now and i'm yeah. not gonna judge myself for that uh, <laughs> that's and, a great i appreciate that's a nice way of putting it yeah well uh, yeah i hope you stand. take well i hope you take that the right way because i like, do it, i do think that that's part of you know the attraction is that people monitor and self-regulate themselves so much now with the consciousness of eyes on them mm. that when you're when you are what you're presenting us with is someone who's not encumbered by that sense or at least at home with what their voice is or what their funny is was part of the reason why comedy and stand up wasn't working at the time for you was part of it that like was part of it that you were not 
the best at repetition, carving, editing it right down and going up as so many people struggle with each night and saying the same shit again, Mm -hmm. except slightly different. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, um, it, it's probably still something that I, that I that I struggle with uh, a a little bit because you know uh, I don't know I, I feel like the more I say things the more it feels like I was trying to do something and just that voice comes in like is that even funny you know mm-hmm. but um it's kind of even why I probably put off getting into stand up for so long it's just like you know um yeah it's just kind of not fully committing to it because i can't (laughs) bear the idea that if i actually put everything into it and it's you know maybe it's still not funny you know a kind of professional half-assedness you know or even you might even put it but i've I've done it since of course and you realize that's just what you have to do but i think at first when i started doing stand-up it was um i think my goal was to physically not die. <laughs> and every time I didn't physically die, I would consider that like that's success and let's have a rake of pints. That was the best set I've ever done <laughs> because I died less. Yes. You know? Yeah. And it goes from pure surviving uh to 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 thriving then at some point, you know? Um we're still yet to thrive <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. You know, it still feels a little bit like survival with style, you know. Um but um, occasionally, you know, well, no, that's you're not being true. you're being modest there. Like, <laughs> if you want to go and see Tony, if you're in Ireland, he is of course going to be in Vicker Street on the seventeenth of September, and there's still a couple of tickets available. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, that's not something that happens because you know you're surviving up there. You've figured out how to marry the two sensibilities of what you've produced online that people have adored so much and bringing that sensibility to the stage and performing stand-up in your own way. Now, I want to see what you think of this theory mm. uh, and then we'll we'll go to our break then. Do you think that acts that die early on in their stand-up life on stage have better prospects for the future than ones that do pretty okay? <laughs> um i think it it i think yes as long as as long as the person who dies takes full responsibility for the fact that it was totally on them because it is always on you there are some variables that maybe you can change where like you know the uh, you couldn't hear the audience as well because the acoustics were weird or there was just one of those one of those audiences <laughs> that just sat there and enjoyed it and smiled, but the mm-hmm. vibe in the room wasn't to scream at the top of their voice in in hysterics, you know. Like yeah. Maybe a few, maybe a few people do, um, but it still is on you to get that reaction every single time, you know. Um, so I think if you die on on your arse, uh, as long as you take it being like, oh great, like the Edison approach, that's ten thousand ways not to tell that joke. Um, really? Then I think, oh my god, you're only going to thrive, you know. Yeah, um, you see, it, I remember Zach Galifianakis saying that it's always the audience's fault. <laughs> <laughs> that's an, I suppose that's another way of doing it as well, because if you carry that level of hubris with you, that's confidence that's going to carry you through. And, you know, that's going to be your pillar when you need it the most. You're never going to flounder like a fish if mm. you're if you think, fuck you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, why are you here? Why do you need me to make you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, we've, we've an awful lot more to talk about in the second half mm. of this conversation. Why not pop on over to patreon.com forward slash Irishman Abroad and get access to hundreds of episodes with the greatest Irish comedians ever to have lived, including Dylan Moore and Tommy Tiernan. There's two Tommy Tiernan episodes up there, Darrow Breen, Ed Byrne, Sharon Horgan, who I mentioned, Ashling B. You name them, they're in the archive over at patreon.com forward slash Irishman Abroad. I can't make this show without your support. So if you want to see it continue, pop over this week pay what you like no uh there's no commitment involved you can cancel whenever you like you can just come over and listen to the rest of the tony episode and then never darken our door ever again <laughs> totally fine with that but uh tony thanks for this first half of this chat really good for yeah, great has earned rave reviews for fancy newspapers